Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church gathered, and good morning, church away. It is good to be here this morning to be able to come and preach the Word of God to you this morning. Open your Bibles to Psalm 32. We're going to be looking at this Psalm of David, and it's a, an amazing psalm, and David shares some of his deep things of his heart in this psalm. In Psalm 32, we're going to be looking at, again, this from verses 1 through 11. This is the Word of God, Psalm 32. The Word of God reads, A Maskell of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Therefore, Let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance, Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, it is... It is a blessed truth that we are forgiven through our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Lord, you have given us your word that we might proclaim your excellencies and we might see your glory, we might see your goodness, we might see your great salvation. God, I pray as we study Psalm 32, Lord, that we would understand not only the depth of our iniquity, but the forgiveness we have in Christ. Lord, I pray that we would learn not to hold on to our sin, but that we would confess our sin, that we would forsake our sin, that we would trust in you, and Lord, that you would bring us deliverance. Lord, we thank you again for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning again. Psalm 32 is an amazing psalm, and it speaks of the great blessing of forgiveness that we have in in the Lord. And for many people, we have our, our favorite psalms. I mean, many people would probably say that Psalm 23 is, is their favorite psalm. I have my favorite psalms. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 51. Another is, is Psalm 25. And many people have Psalm 32 as their, their favorite psalm. And one of the people that had this as their favorite psalm was St. Augustine of Hippo, who was a great influence on the early church. And he considered this to be one of his favorite psalms of all. In fact, James Montgomery Boy says that as Augustine approached the end of his life, he had, to ins- he had this inscribed on his wall by his bed so that he could see it as he lay down and as he woke up. I mean, just think you have that psalm there. You're, you're growing old. You're growing weak. You're, you're becoming frail, and you want this there. So as you look out of your bed, you see this psalm inscribed there as a reminder of God's goodness and his grace. And as we read this this morning, you'll see, notice that the psalm begins with a maskell of David. And we don't know exactly what that word maskell means. We know that at its root, it, it means teaching. It's a psalm of teaching, a, a psalm of, of med- meditation, a psalm of, of, uh, to ponder. And what that really gives us is a picture. It's a psalm of instruction. And you see that as we, as we read, you, you hear that word selah in verses 4 and verses 5 and verse 7. That, that word selah, again, is not really understood completely, but it is believed that it's a, a, like pause and meditate and stop and reflect on what you've just sang or what you've just heard. 
That word sail, it brings us to a point where as we read these verses, we can come to a place where we want to sit and we want to reflect. We don't want to move too quickly. Most commentators believe that this psalm was was written after Nathan the prophet rebuked David for his horrible sin against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. If you remember, uh, David is a king and he's in his palace and he sees Bathsheba and, and he sees her and he goes after her and he commits adultery with her. And in order to cover it up, he, he tries to get Uriah to come back and he, he brings Uriah back and he wants Uriah to, to sleep with his wife so that uh, they may think that the, the child that is, she has conceived is his. And, and Uriah, being an honorable man, says, no, I'm not going to do that. And Uriah eventually goes back to the front lines and in order to cover it up, David wants to hide his sin and he, he sends Uriah to the front line. And what happens is David tells uh, his leaders to back off of Uriah, and Uriah is, is murdered. These are horrible sins where David did not repent. He didn't repent for over a year until Nathan the prophet comes. And we know that Nathan the, the prophet comes, and he tells David the story of, about a, a rich man who, who stole a, a poor man's only lamb. And David says, that man should be killed. And Nathan says to David, you are the man. He gets in his face and points his finger, you are the man, David. David at that point understands that, that he is undone and that he needs to come before Christ. And the reason that this psalm is so loved by so many people is that it, it really captures our, exp- our experiences as Christians. Because as Christians, we know our sin. We know our sin and we know the times that we, we are living in sin and that, that we're unrepentant. And, and that, that same unrepentance is followed often by, by confession and that confession leads to that feeling of forgiveness and that, that weight lifting off of us and that weight of guilt being lifted off. We can rejoice and we can be happy. And it gra- this psalm grabs our hearts because we can relate to it. G. Campbell Morgan said of this psalm, he said, it is a psalm of pen- penitence. It's a psalm of a repentance. But he goes on, but it's also a song of, ra- of a ransomed soul rejoicing in the wonders of the grace of God. Sin is dealt with, sorrow is comforted, ignorance is instructed. Sin is dealt with, sorrow is comforted, ignorance is instructed. Isn't that great? I mean, isn't that something that wants us to, to rejoice, to see how blessed we are in the forgiveness that God has given us? And David begins, he, he begins with a shout of praise, and we see this in verse is 1 and 2, the, the blessing of forgiveness. He says in verse 1, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, King David purposely uses these, these three words to describe sin. And you see them right there in the text. He uses these, these three, three words, transgression, sin, and in verse 2, he uses the word iniquity. And Pastor Kevin talked about these just a, a few weeks ago in Psalm 38. And he, he's, what David is doing, he's, he's bringing these, these three together to show how ultimately rebellious he is and how uh, his rebellion has, has dominated his whole life. And that word transgression speaks of his willful rebellion of, of God's authority. I mean, do you realize that sin ultimately is a, a rebellion against God? If you sin against your husband, ultimately it's a rebellion against God. If, if you sin against your wife, ultimately it's a rebellion against God. If, if fathers sin against their children, it's a rebellion against God. If children sin against their fathers and mothers, it's a rebellion against God. Ultimately, all sin is a rebellion against God because we are created in His image, and He is the Creator, and He is the Holy One. So He speaks of transgression, but He also speaks of sin, and and sin speaks of simply falling short of God's expectation, of God's requirement. And we know as Christians, we all fall short of God's requirement. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again, it's that picture of an archer who doesn't just not hit the target or hit the target in the center. It's, it's a picture of not even making it to the target. And so we all fall short of God's glory. And, and then David uses the word iniquity, which speaks of his crookedness and his twistedness and twistedness 
that he is perverted. And when you look back at, at what David did to Uriah and Bathsheba, you see those things. David was planning, he was devising his sin. It wasn't just something that, that all of a sudden happened. Like some, somebody all of a sudden you know, cuts you off on the freeway and you, and you react and you're, you're angry for a second. That's bad enough, right? But David, what he does is he plans it all out. He plans his adultery out, and then he plans to cover it up, and he, he plans the murder of Uriah. It's, it's premeditated, and we tend to look out, out at the world today. What we do today is we, we look at the world, and we, we can't comprehend all the things that are happening in this world. We look at the world, and we go, sin is just growing, and it's getting worse and worse, and people are living more and more wickedly. But as we point the finger out of the world, we have to remember that David is, is pointing the finger at himself in this psalm. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to do. We need to look at ourselves. We need to, to look at ourselves. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 7. He says, take the plank out of your own eye first so that you can see the speck in your brother's eye. Looking at our, ourselves first, and, and David does this. He, he looks at what he has done, and, and, and as King David... As the king of Israel, he had a responsibility to know the word of God. In fact, in Deuteronomy 17, it was required of kings that they would copy the whole Torah. I mean, can you imagine how long that would take in to, to copy the Hebrew text? And it was overseen by the priests that they would make sure that they, the king wasn't just, you know, quickly writing it through. No, they, they had to take their time and it had to be approved. And then he was to keep the law with him and he was to keep this, and he, he, he was to read it every day, all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord and to keep his statutes. And David knew this, and yet he sinned greatly, and his soul was twisted and warped, and it, it brought him to a place that, where he was controlled by his, his transgression, his sin, and his iniquity. And so he begins the psalm, and he he celebrates the forgiveness he has with, with these three terms, and we see them again in order forgiven. He's, he's covered, and he counts no iniquity. Basically, his sin was removed, and he was covered. And we, we often, what do we try to do like David? We try to cover our sin. We try to hide it. We try to be somebody that we're not real, you know, that's not real, and we try to cover up these, these sins, and we want people to think the best of us, and, you know, but God covers our sin, and he doesn't count our iniquity against us. And this is God's way of, of dealing with sin. He doesn't simply just remove it. He doesn't simply cover it. He, he doesn't count the iniquity against us. And, and Paul uses these, these uh, first two verses in Psalm 32 where it's not just that he doesn't count the iniquities that we committed. He actually counts Christ's righteousness to our count. And that's the, the amazing thing. We're not only looked at as... as uh, forgiven, but we're, we're looked at as righteous. So in David's great sin, he is forgiven, but even more than that, he's counted as, as righteous. His premeditated adultery, his premeditated murder against a brother and sister, and here he is forgiven, and no wonder he is rejoicing. And can you imagine standing before the judge? You know you're guilty, and the judge says, not guilty. <laughs> think, how could that be? Because Christ paid your price. He paid the debt that was due you. If you notice in verses 1 and 2, he uses the word blessed twice. In verse 1, blessed is the one. In verse 2, blessed is the man. But, but that word blessed doesn't really capture the fullness of that, that word. The word blessed is, is, is plural. Basically, it could be this, the, the blessednesses. Or, or the great blessing, or, or the overwhelming blessing that we have received in Christ as being forgiven. Charles Spurgeon will say this, Oh, the blessednesses, the double joys, the bundles of happiness, the mountains of delight. Sadly, we go on so long as Christians, and we grow older and older in the faith, and we start to forget our past, and we start to forget how forgiven we are, and we start to think more of ourselves and our own righteousness rather than the righteousness of Christ. You know, David, in effect, is preaching the gospel to himself here. He's reminding himself of the truth that, that in his great iniquity, he has been forgiven. 
And David's soul rejoices in great delight that he has been forgiven and his forgiveness is genuine. And how do we know that his forgiveness is genuine? Because his grief, his sorrow brought about repentance. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. This forgiveness was brought about as he came clean regarding his sin. His confession brought him life. It, it, it brought him joy. You know, he wasn't living that, that double life that he had before. First John says that if we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. But he says this as well, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where David's sin was great, God's grace was greater. You know, I read in, in my studies about an elder who was in the, the city of New York. And it, as he was in New York, one of the other congregants saw him and saw him with a, a prostitute. And that same elder who was seen with a prostitute, flew home that very day and went to church and led an evangelistic banquet, living a, a, a double life, living a life of deceit. Remember what it says in chapter 2? He says, he was a man in who, whose spirit there was no deceit. This elder was living a, a life of deceit. He was living a, a, a double life, and, and you can so easily get sucked into your sin, and, and, and you're not honest, and what your sin does is it overcomes you. And there, there's a, a great deceit in unconfessed sin, and there's a, a, a self-deceit about your, your own condition with God. Oh, you know, God is gracious, and I can go do whatever I want, and, and that's just so untrue. But there's also a a public deceit and a private deceit that you're not the person who people really think you are. And that was true of David. For that year after committing adultery and, and, and commissioning a, a mur the murder of Uriah, he was living a double life. He, he was a man that, that was looked upon as, as being the king, the righteous king. Now we're, again, David goes on and he he tells about his life of unconfessed sin, and we see this in 3 and 4. This weight of guilt that was upon him, our second point. He says, for when I kept silent, uh, when, when he says that, when, when I kept silent, he was being deceitful. He wasn't confessing his sin. My wife's grandmother will, will say this, that if you don't tell the truth, you don't say anything, that's not lying. That's living a lie. <laughs> it's living a lie. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. I mean, you, you hear those words, and, 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 and some of you have probably felt that. When, when you're in a place of sin, and you're in a place of rebellion against God, and you don't come to and confess, God's hand becomes heavy upon you. And when you go back to, to 1 Samuel chapter 11, and you can... Read this again about David's massive cover-up, and he, he, David does all these things to, to hide his sin. To tr he tried to keep it si silent about it. He tried to cover it up. He, I, as I said, he, he brought Uriah home and from the battlefield, and he was hoping that U Uriah would sleep with his wife, and then he sends Uriah back and has Uriah, Uriah killed. And David can easily think at this point, what, it's all taken care of. Nobody knows. It's all good. But it's not all good, is it? Because God knows what he's done. God knows what he's doing. You know, David said this, when I kept silent, when I did not confess it, what happens? He speaks of the miseries of, of unconfessed sin. He is tormented. And the physical effects of his spiritual state are, are, are staggering. He speaks of his bones wasting away, groaning all day long. We all know that as we get older, our, our bones get, get weaker. As I'm getting older, I'm noticing that. But David says, my bones were wasting away. Literally, his bones were growing old. This is one of the fascinating studies, and I think, uh, in human physiology that is the, the mystery that we really can't completely understand, but the spiritual 
has effects on the physical. I mean, people get ulcers because of, of guilt. People get high blood pressure because of guilt. People get ill because of guilt. David was, was feeling the pressure and the heaviness of God's hand on him. He says in verse 4, he says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. The misery, the torment was because of, day, of God. David says his hand was, was heavy upon me. God was pressing down on David. And, and David's trying to uh, forget his sin, but, but God is not going to let him forget his sin. No, God will not let it go. God is, is pressing David, and his hand is heavy upon him, and, and David is about uh, to be crushed. And this is what happens when you don't confess your sins. And this is why I think Psalm 32 is, is really speaking to, to, to believers, those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, not necessarily to unbelievers, because we know that, that many unbelievers, I know from my own experience, that, that when I lived and when I sinned before I was a Christian, nothing bothered me. Now, if somebody got mad at me or I hurt somebody and, and my reputation was ruined, that might hurt me. But I could live a life of sin and, and, and get away with it, and I didn't feel guilty. I went to bed at night. I slept. But as a Christian, what happens is that we go through, we, we sin, and God is, is heavy upon us. He doesn't want to let us go. And this is a good thing that He doesn't let us go. You know, in this world today, people sin grotesquely and flagrantly, and they sleep well, and they can steal from their employer, and they can come home completely fine. They can commit adultery, and they're completely fine. There is no guilt. But God's people, and this is, this is actually one of the signs that you're one of God's people, is that you cannot live in your sin. You can't just keep on going on with it. And if, you, if you're not convicted and you're going on with it, then my question would be, are you a believer? Because when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, and He, he can... He convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So sin is, is a thing that brings God's hand of heaviness upon us. And it's hard, and you cannot live in a state of unconfessed sin because God will make you miserable. Charles Spurgeon said this again. He said, God's hand is, is very helpful when it, when it uplifts, but it is awful when it presses down. Better a world on the shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on the heart like David. Better a world on the shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on the heart like David. And the question I need to ask you brothers and sisters who are here and those who are afar is this, is God's hand heavy upon you? Are you living in a, in a place of unconfessed sin where, where God presses down on you God's hand will press down on you, brothers and sisters, until you confess, until you repent. And if you are one of His, you can try to cover it up, but it will, it will sap all of your strength. And David literally says, my strength was dried up. The, the word literally means my life juices are drying up. My, my life, the life juices are being sucked out of me. He's in, a, he's in a miserable, tormented state because he has kept silent about his sin. And, and it says he was dried up like the heat of summer. It was, reminded me of my hiking trip, trip with my wife last year where we were hiking. We climbed this mountain together. And we, at the beginning of the trip, we, we started out with two full containers of water. And by the time we got back, I had finished mine and I was stealing <laughs> water from my wife. Actually, she was giving it to me <laughs> freely. <laughs> but I was so thirsty, and as we came to the end of this, this trip, I, I was just longing to get back to our camp where I, where I could get more, more water. And you know, had, What did this thirst tell me? This thirst told me that I, that I needed to drink. If I don't drink, I'm, I'm going to die. Maybe not then, literally, but, but what it does is this heaviness, this hand, tells us what we must do, that we, we must go to God and we must confess to God. We must repent of our sin. So what does David do? He drinks. He drinks from, 
the fountain of life. He says in verse 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. In an instant, his guilt is gone. In an instant. When David said to, to Samuel, when Samuel had rebuked him, David said to, I mean, David said to Nathan, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. That was his confession. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. I mean, in a moment, in an instant, David is, is forgiven by the Lord. And it reminds me of the, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, where the prodigal son takes his inheritance, and he goes and he squanders his inheritance. And he lives he starts to, to feed the pigs, and he longs to eat what the pigs are eating, and, and he finally comes to his sen senses, and he says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He wants to be treated as a servant. And so he goes to his father, and his father sees him far off, and, and the father runs to him, and, and, and the son begins to say, and what the son says is, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And, and the father stops him right there. He interrupts him and he says, no, you're not one of my servants. I call my servants. And my servants, I want you to go and kill the fattened calf. And they come and they, they kill the fattened calf and, and there's this celebration. And, he, and the father says, for this is my this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The joys of forgiveness. And again, you see David groanings and his misery is turned into, into songs of joy, but you have to come to him and you have to come to him now. So many people want to hold off and they want to say, no, let me just hold on to this. Now, David next speaks of the urgency of confession, that we need to do it now. And you see this in, in, in verse 6, because the ability to be forgiven is, is there within a millisecond. And he says in verse 6, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. Brothers and sisters, we pray when God can be found. If you haven't put your trust in the Lord, pray now. We pray when, when God can be found. And there's an urgency here. It, it, it can't be put off because when we put off confession, what happens is our hearts begin to be hardened. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, he says this, but exhort one another every day. That's what I'm here, exhorting you every day. As long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. No, do it now. Do it today. Then he goes on in verse 15, quoting from Psalm 95. He says, As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Now, what are you saying? Do it now. Can confess your sins now. I remember years ago watching YouTube videos of the tsunami in, in 2004 in, in, in Indonesia, and it was the day after Christmas, and people were there on holiday, and, and they're, they're enjoying their vacation on, on, on these sunny beaches in Indonesia, and they're, they're there, and they see this phenomenon of the, of the water on the beach rushing out, and the beach is becoming drier and drier farther and farther out, and you see in these videos that, that people are just walking out, like, isn't this amazing? We can go out and pick up shells out here now. And they don't realize what's actually coming upon them, that, that the tsunami is actually coming in. And finally, you see some people starting to realize that, oh my goodness, this wave is coming and there's, it, it's really too late. And some are turning around and fleeing. And I, I just remember distinctively this, this one man on the beach, and he's, he's on the beach and he's just walking just slowly up the beach away from the ocean as if nothing is happening in, in the world. And this 30-foot wave is just rushing at him, and it just sweeps him away. How tragic that, that was, and how tragic it is, but 
But so many people are unwilling to come and, 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 and confess, and only those people who, who reached higher ground survived. Verse 6 again says, Offer prayer to you. I offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. See, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, if you come and you confess your sin, God will place you in higher ground. He'll place you in a place where those waves and those floods cannot reach you. And David responds to this good news with a a shout of praise. You see that in his response in verse 7. He says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Again, David has been trying to hide his sins, and now he says that God is his hiding place. What a change has taken place. David rejoices. And I was thinking about this, and I remember one time we were playing hide-and-go-seek at our house with Steve Sanchez. Many of you guys know Steve, Pastor Steve. His daughters were at our house, and we were playing hide-and-go-seek, and his daughter, Laura Land was hiding. And it was, it was crazy because she was hiding, and she was hiding so long and so good we couldn't find her anywhere. And we were searching everywhere in this house, and we're looking here, looking there, and I was, I was starting to get anxious, like she had disappeared or something, and I couldn't find her. And we were, we were telling Laurel Ann, Laurel Ann, come out, and she would not come out. We couldn't believe this. Finally, I think, I think finally she did get out when she heard the urgency of my voice, and we found her. She was hiding. We had two curtains in our bathroom. One was on the outside of the, the, the tub, one was on the inside, and she was laying on the edge of the tub. And we couldn't find her. It was, it was the best hiding place. But God is the best hiding place, isn't he? We, we often run to so many different things, don't we? We run to food. We run to people. We run to things. But God is the best place to run. And God is our, our hiding place, and he is our protection. He is the safest place that we can go. God is is a place, and we know that this really speaks to being in His presence and, and in, his, in His temple. David says in Psalm 25, verse 27, verse 5, he says, For He will hide me in the shelter, in His shelter, in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Again, there's that protection from the flood. He's going to lift me high upon the rock. And notice this is the same man that God's hand was heavy upon him, and here he finds shelter in him. Do you ever feel like you can't go to God because you're afraid of him? You know how you cure that? You confess. You come to him. And in that confession, in that repentance, he, he embraces you, and you're no longer afraid. You feel his love and his concern and his care. You know, have you ever held on to your sin? sin in, in miserable silence, only to find yourself groaning that God's hand is heavy upon you, pressing down until your strength is, is gone. And then you come and you confess to Him, and, and you, you remember that, and you look back at that, and you remember that, that freedom that you felt. I remember that. I remember that feeling. I remember that feeling of joy. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And it's like the end of a, a war. The, the war is finally over. The battle is won. And then in verse 8 and 9, you, you see this change of voice. Now it's not David speaking any longer. It's God speaking. And you see this instruction of God in verse 8 and 9. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. What David, I mean, what God is saying is, don't be stubborn. Listen to David. Don't be foolish. The, the image that God warns us against is a, a stubborn animal, and that's what, exactly what David has been in his rebellion. He's been like a, a stubborn animal, a, a condition of, and a season of unconfessed sin. David could only be, be guided by pain or, or severity. God allowed the Amalekites to devastate David and his men in 1 Samuel 30. That was devastating to David. God sent Nathan to speak sharply to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. 
Like a stubborn animal, David would not come near to God until he had these, these experiences. And God speaks to us through David's experience and says, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. Don't be like that. Come clean, confess. And David concludes this psalm with a, a summary. And that summary, he says in, in verse 10, he begins with many are the, the sorrows of the wicked. That really looks back at verses 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the the heat of summer. Again, this weight, the sorrows of the wicked. David sees himself as the wicked. But then he goes on, he says, But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And that that word steadfast love is the word hesed, uh, It's the covenant love of God that he has for his people. And this love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And that is what David experienced. And then the psalm ends in in the way that it began in verses 1 and 2. We see this in verse 11. Verse 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And we should. We should rejoice in the Lord because of what David has taught in Psalm 32 is is good news. In fact, it's the gospel. It's good news that God forgives sinners, which is really the heart of the gospel. And if you remember, there was no provision in the Old Testament for the sins that David had committed. There was no provision or sacrifice for the premeditated adultery and the premeditated murder that that David had committed. He thought each, each of these sins through and he planned them out and there was no way out there was no forgiveness there was nothing he could do unless god simply forgave him this is why david says in psalm 51 for you will not delight in sacrifice or i would give it you will not be pleased with burnt with a burnt offering the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O god you will not despise that was only david's hope that that god would not despise his broken and contrite heart, that David would come and beg God for his mercy. There's nothing that he could do except throw himself on the mercy of God, and he was forgiven. And David trusted God alone for his salvation. And this is why Paul quotes Psalm 32 in Romans chapter 4 to show that David was saved by grace through faith alone, and he was counted as righteous. And listen to what Paul says In Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, and and, and just hear Psalm 32 in these verses. He says, David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's great news. This is the gospel. And I want to speak to two sets of people here. One are are you Christians who are here? If you have the weight of sin on you and you have, are living in a place where you're not com- communicating with God because of that sin, go to him and confess. Remember what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Remember that, brothers and sisters. Remember that. Don't hold on to it. Feel the freedom that God has promised you by coming and confessing. Let him take that burden off of you. The other group I want to speak to are those of you who have not yet placed your trust in Jesus Christ. The Word of God says this, that that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul will say in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, by confessing, by coming and, and, and seeking God and, and seeking the forgiveness that we have in Christ, that He died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, you can have that life, that life in Christ. And if you're still carrying that burden, why not come to Him? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All your guilt will be taken away. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your enduring word. Lord, we thank you that you have given it to us that is pure and holy and righteous and good, and by it we are instructed. God, I thank you for David and his life, Lord, that he was a man after your own heart, but he was also a, a broken man and a, a weak man, but he found his refuge in you, his Savior. God, we thank you again for the life we have in Christ and the life we have in your body. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.